My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm working with the OSU Library on a project called Oklahoma Women of the Oklahoma Legislature, Past and Present. And this is April the 2nd, 2007, and we're at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. Speaking with Angela Monson, who was in the House from 1991 to 93, mm -hmm. and the Senate from 1993 to 2005. Recently, 2005. So, so thankful that you're willing to talk with us today. Thank you very much, Tanya. Okay, well, let's begin by uh, bringing us a little bit of uh, background about your hometown, your, your youth. All righty. So, I was born and raised right here in Oklahoma City. Was, um, my parents both are native to Oklahoma. I say my mom is native, although she was born in Texas. She moved here when she was just a couple of months old. Uh, my dad was the fourth generation Oklahoman born in, here in Oklahoma. His, his uh, grandmother was born before statehood here, and so were several, his grandfather and his great-grandfather. So Oklahoma is, of course, home for me for a whole lot of reasons. And now that I'm old enough and have literally traveled the world, I choose to stay here. This is home. I was educated in the Oklahoma City Public Schools. I attended my first year of college at the University of Oklahoma on the President's Leadership Class Scholarship. I ultimately chose a major. That major was not offered at OU, unfortunately. So after much negotiation with my father, I was allowed to leave and walk away from what would have been a full-ride scholarship, ultimately, to go to Oklahoma City University, and uh, where I completed my undergrad studies with the math, with the bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Uh, at that time, it was law enforcement. People know the criminal justice major. It was at that time actually law enforcement corrections. Uh, after working as a probation parole officer for about a year in Shawnee, Oklahoma, love the work, uh, but you can imagine Shawnee, Oklahoma back in the mid 70s uh, for this young 21 year old, just was my cup of tea. Uh, I finally came to work back in the city with a community corrections organization called CREO the Council for Resocialization of Ex-Offenders. And we provided transitional services to people being released from our adult corrections institutions here in Oklahoma, and ultimately expanded our program to include a juvenile program, a juvenile justice program. I served as first director of that program, just providing varying support services to, to young people who were basically court ordered to our program and other prevention kinds of activities. And I guess it was that experience at PREO and at the Department of Corrections that I realized I didn't want to necessarily be the implementer of the rules, mm -hmm. but thought it would be helpful to be the rule maker. Um, so I went back to grad school, attended Oklahoma University, and received a master's in public administration, never intending, of course, at that time to be a lawmaker, simply wanted to be one engaged in the development of public policy. I worked for a short time as a traveling city manager. My grad school track really was primarily focused in municipal management, budget, and finance. And after being on the road about 3,500 miles a month, each month, between six small towns, I received a call from the state legislative, uh, state, the state legislature, a staffer there, who said, we've got a new job. Your name was given to me, highly recommended. Would you be interested in visiting? And I thought, oh, what the hey? I'll go in and talk with him. It wasn't that I didn't like my traveling city manager's job. It was a job. It was a grind. Enjoyed it very much, but, you know, explore new opportunities. So I had a conversation with Mr. Paul McElvaney, a very good friend of mine. Uh, now he is. I didn't know him then. He explained to me this new position as a fiscal staff analyst, staffing a brand new committee, Joint Committee on Federal Funds. And that committee had the responsibility to track the receipt and expenditure of federal dollars and state agencies, determine the programmatic impact and other kinds of things related to the receipt of federal dollars. Um, and it sounded like a wonderful opportunity. So I ultimately, after some discussions and interviews with some legislators, uh, said yes. I went to work then for the Oklahoma State Legislature as one of the very few joint employees at that time. It was right when the Oklahoma Senate and the Oklahoma House of Representatives had actually split their staffing. So my first boss was Roger Randall, uh, who now is engaged in higher ed himself. And I worked for Roger for that first year. And the next year, Cleta Detheridge. 
uh, was the appro House Appropriations Chair. My, ch my bosses were the chairs of the Appropriations Committee. And I crunched numbers and I did program evaluations. And I found that actually in uh, the early 80s, when we had a new federal administration, executive administration, and with a huge federal uh, budget cut, uh, greatest impact though, however, was not in state agencies, but in community-based organizations. And it led me to actually the Mira Mahoney Community Health Center. And I became involved with Mira Mahoney, learned more about the program, the people who needed their services. And I described that because it was that experience that led me to this health policy track where I found myself. So I continued to work for the legislature for about four years, still engaged in health policy activities, primarily as a volunteer, just learning the industry, and uh, then decided to run for office. Mm -hmm. After seeing what went on in the state legislature, I thought, I can do this, and maybe I could, like we all think, can do it better than <laughs> some who were there. So I ran for office initially in 84. I lost that race by 132 votes, 137 votes. It was very, very close. Um, and was quite disappointed, but certainly could hold my head high because of the showing that we made. It was an excellent showing uh, for a first-time contender against a very well-liked incumbent. Um, and after I lost that race, I didn't have a job because, of course, I had to leave my job at the legislature to run. I was out of money because I spent all my savings in the campaign. So I was really, really stressed and crying one day, literally, at my sister's house, who very lovingly said to me, and I say that facetiously, uh, I don't know why you're sitting on my couch crying. What you need to do is get a plan. You need to get a job, get a plan. And I was somewhat shocked into reality and decided she's right. I needed a plan, I needed a job. So I I wanted to, to remain active in politics. I knew I'd run for office again. So I turned down several positions offered back to me at the state legislature and went to work for the Equitable Life Insurance Company, selling insurance. It provided me flexibility. It allowed me to actually pick up a couple of legislative lobbying contracts, which I did uh, for community action agencies and for a group of community clinics. My engagement with the com community clinics had grown and grown. I had learned more and more. And coupled with my legislative experience, you know, we needed somebody at the Capitol. So I, I remained involved, learned more about the insurance industry. I mentioned that too, because it was so valuable to my continued growth and development of information related to health care and how health insurance products were sold, or in this case, were not sold by the equitable back in the mid 80s because they realized then it was not a profitable book of business. It was very difficult to manage and was not their niche. So after two more bids, one more bid for the legislature, one more failed bid for the Oklahoma House of Representatives in 1988, I was finally successful in 1990. Fortunately, in 1986, a job was offered to me uh, with the Oklahoma Health Care Campaign. Oklahoma Health Care Project is what it was called. Uh, it was the beginning of a consumer-based health advocacy initiative in Oklahoma, funded by then the Villers Foundation. That foundation is now Families USA. And I happen to sit on that board of directors. It's, you know, full circle again. Uh, but that four-year experience allowed me to hone my, my expertise in health care, uh, from a policy perspective, fi you know, financial perspective, delivery systems, quality issues, never was a provider, thought I'd want to be a long time ago, um, but I did learn more, I did more, uh, had an opportunity to continue my work at the Capitol. In fact, we were successful in the Oklahoma Health Care Project for the first large expansion of Medicaid income eligibility for children and pregnant women in the late 1980s. So it was a wonderful experience. Fortunately, in 1990, when the incumbent chose not to run again, uh, although I was not her chosen candidate uh, to succeed her, uh, we did a bang up job in the 90 race and I was able to move to the legislature. And then the rest is history. So the, one, the seat that you finally won was a woman had held it before. A woman too. had held that seat before. Actually, that she had only been the second third person in, second or third person in that seat. So uh, history in the both my Senate seat 
uh, Senate District 48, in the House seat, House District 99, a long history of long-serving members uh, who have been in those positions. I actually was the only, only the third senator to hold that that post in the Senate District 48 seat. So it's great. Yeah, Freddie Williams was the incumbent, and it was so kind of bizarre because she was a good family friend, a friend of my mom's. I had much respect and admiration admiration for her. Uh, so it wasn't. It wasn't anything, and I say this, and I really mean this, it wasn't as if um, I thought she was doing such a terrible job, not at all. It was that I thought I had something to offer. And I think that's an important message for women to always hear uh, because we always think we have to be against or, or not in favor of somebody or something to work to change it. Not necessarily. If we think we have the capabilities and the expertise and the skill set necessary to do a job and do it well, then we should move in that direction. And I did. And your sister's plan helped. And my sister, that was just that little touch of, that little dose of reality. My sister, um, Denise, my sister was 13 months older than I am. Denise died in 1998 um, from lung cancer. She was a very young woman, 42 years old. 42 years old, would have been 42 years old that year. Uh, she was the mother of uh, two small children. Um, who came to live with me when she was ill. Uh, those children were nine and 18 months when they came to live with me. They're now 12 and 19. My my nephew son, son nephew, is a freshman at Al Alpena Community College in Alpena, Michigan. And the then 18 month old is now this driving me crazy 12 year old who's sixth grader at a local high school, Northeast, Northeast Academy for Health Sciences and Engineering. So when you were in high school, did you ever think about being in nope. college? Not, nope. Not to run for elective office per se. However, I had my first experience running for elective office when I was age 14. It's so bizarre. Uh, when I was 14, growing up in Oklahoma City, there were no African Americans on the Oklahoma City School Board. And there were issues. I mean, this is the uh, before integration period. and uh, So there were issues in the district. So the Urban League at that time began this community-based initiative to create what was deemed a Black Board of Education. It was kind of a shadow board, and it was really more, it was created more to make a statement about, about the lack of representation from this segment of the community. So there was one youth slot uh, placed on, on this configuration of a board, and you actually had to run for office. So there were three of us who filed for this seat, and we ran campaigns and we worked hard. There were designated voting areas. I mean, it was just like a campaign. And I won that race at age 14. And that was my first, I tell people, my first uh, experience with elective office. And I grew up, you know, in school leadership activities in the, in the student council and school district-wide leadership councils. But no, running for political office as a, as a chosen uh, profession, a chosen career, I never ever crossed my mind until I began my work with the legislature and really realized that I did have something to offer. Uh, but it was not something I thought about. And, and I think that's important too. We need the younger the better to make sure young women understand that elective office, public service, governmental service, really really is a great service choice for those people who are so inclined to want to move in that direction and to start early because there are so many difficulties it's hard for young women who want to have children and have a family to run for office to to be elected and move to oklahoma city and, and kids are three and four and five years old or whatever age at home in tulsa or, or woodward or wherever and to move here and live four days out of a week here for you know, four, five, six months a year. It's very difficult, but we have to figure out as a society how we create opportunities for women. You know, other cultures have, not only they have targets for women in elective office and legislative body, bodies, I mean, they work really hard to create the kind of systems and support that's necessary so women can serve in that capacity. And unfortunately, we haven't done the same in this country. Were your parents involved in politics? Not really. My parents were not uh, active in campaigns 
Although they talked politics, politics was quite frequently discussed in our household. They were regular voters. My dad was very involved in community activities, and my mom was very, very involved in church activities. So they were service-minded to parents. But I, I think I surprised all of us when I decided, maybe it wasn't a surprise, because my mom would tell stories about uh, when I was a little girl, how I brought friends home uh, with me for lunch and was very proud to have these friends, as I described them, with me. And they were just kids. I remember this well. Kids who I know needed to eat. And my grandmother lived with us when I grew up. There were five kids, my mom, my dad, and grandma in this big house. It was a very loving, warm household. So I thought if a kid needed something to eat, come home with me. There's always enough. There's always somebody there. So my mom says she was never surprised. I was a little surprised. Uh, and I think the rest of my family was somewhat surprised, but you know, not a family trait. I don't think there are others really growing up to become politicians, maybe some of my little cousins, I'm not sure, but certainly my family has been really exposed to politics. That's My family was the core of my campaign, always, always was, uh, and I attribute, I attribute my success to the support and the love and the help that I received from my family. And, and how much in your campaign each time? It probably cost more? Yeah. The first campaign in 1984 uh, cost me basically all of my saved money, which was about $14,000. I may have raised another three or four. So we're talking about less than a $20,000 campaign. Lots of door knocking. And although all of my campaigns throughout were lots of door knocking, the cost of my last Senate race, which of course is a larger race than a, than a House race, the cost of my last Senate race was about seventy seventy five thousand dollars $75,000. Still a whole lot less than what many senators now pay. Oklahoma State senators in a race, it's not uncommon to see them spend maybe a couple hundred grand in a Senate seat. So, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard now, raising money. You know, I couldn't do it on that little same $14,000 I was able to save and, and have available to use back in 84 time really brings about a change. Well, do you remember the first day that you stepped in and took office? Yes. In fact, I look at that those pictures and I think, we'll never be able to wear that suit again. <laughs> uh, it was about four sizes ago, I guarantee you. Uh, I remember that day well. I remember my family being present and uh, all the people important to me being present and the smiles and how I got to introduce them. But I also remember the sense of urgency and the sense of obligation, the sense of responsibility. As you took the oath of office, it was a very moving experience for me. And and I knew the Capitol. I mean, I'd been in the building for 10 years prior to taking the oath of office, but it was like a, a very unique um, transitional experience to understand now that it is your obligation, it is your responsibility to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves, to be prepared. So when you are moving into a debate or a discussion about legislation, your responses are correct if you are, if you are being questioned, and then your questions are appropriate if you are doing the questioning. So it was always very serious to me to be prepared, to do work, to be responsive. I was not the perfect legislator. None of us are perfect in anything that we do. I always wished I could be more timely with my phone calls. I always wished I was one of those people who remembered birth dates and uh, all those things to send nice cards to people. And but that I just that I didn't do that. But I still think I was a pretty good legislator. Do you have any idea how many bills you may have? Whoa, passed. Just, yeah, just a uh, guess. Oh, I would say over 15 years in the legislature, this is going to be a rough guess. I think I, let's just say I introduced on an average, these are all going to be bills that I initiated, whether they're House or Senate bills. Uh, let's say I introduced on an average 30, 35 bills a year. And on an average, 15 of them became law for 15 years. So we're talking 225 bills. Maybe 250 bills. It's, I mean, that's a pretty good track record. It probably is more than that if I actually did the count. Uh, many of those bills, though, the general public would be totally oblivious to. Uh, there are bills that help internally government operate more efficiently. There are bills that only a small segment of people would be interested in or concerned about. Uh, but there are a few out there 
that really made a difference in people's lives. And that I appreciate given having that opportunity. Can you name a few of the well, primary yeah, ones? Yeah, let me just name a few of the, the primary ones because okay. I, I, I feel good about them. Um, the mental health parity bill is a bill that began the process. It was it was not all that we wanted, but it was a huge start to ensure that insurance companies and other uh, health care pro- uh, insurance providers, coverage providers, treated mental illness, biologically based mental illness, as any other illness. Uh, just because the disease tends to is in the brain does not mean that that person is is less deserving than an individual who di- whose disease began in the heart or the lungs or some other part of the body. So we were able to pass legislation and it took almost four years of really, really hard work of fighting the insurance industry and the coverage industry. Um, having, dis- you know, the, the, the whole concern went across the gamut. The chambers, employers, everybody who just knew this would raise the cost of insurance but we had numbers that already proved in other states where similar legislation was passed, even more expensive legislation was passed. There was no increase in the cost of insurance attributable to this change. So it took a long time, but that made a big difference. And then, then people, instead of having five visits a year or 30 days of inpatient treatment, it was treated just like any other physical illness, which which. When I read the letters and talked to family members who had loved ones who were suffering from various mental illnesses, I, I knew it was the right thing. One of the other bills we did was a continued expansion of med- Medicaid eligibility uh, for pregnant women and, and children uh, that directly gave more access to health care services to more people. And that was why it went into the legislature to start it's really, really working hard on ensuring that every Oklahoman had some guaranteed access to health care services. Uh, that's what took me there, and that's what we worked hard on. So all these bills, uh, the, the prescription drug um, authority bill for advanced practice nurses, I thought was important, and people don't realize it. You go to the doc, you see the nurse uh, midwife, or you see the advanced practice uh, pediatric nurse, and they could see you, diagnose you, know what you need, but couldn't give you the script. So we were able, and again, that's a lot, a lot of years of fighting for that bill. We're actually able to pass legislation that gave these advanced practice nurses, again, under the guidance and the protocols established by a supervising physician, of the authority to write prescription drugs for things that they, they knew and that they could very easily prescribe medications for. So I think those there, there are any number of bills along that line. There's some tax bills I'm pretty proud of. There are other bills related to financing of things that I am very proud of. But I think if someone to ask were to ask me choose two or three, those would be the two or three that stand out. No one knows I did them, and that's okay. It was not done for credit, but I guarantee you they really did change the course of life for a whole lot of folk. Any that you tried to pass that didn't get yep. passed? Major of course. The very first, my very first year in the legislature, could ever forget that. Of course, I went to, to the legislature addressing health care issues, correct? So my very, very first big bill that year was a bill to create um, universal health care access. It was a single payer plan bill. And, and it was pretty direct to implement this single, keep in mind, this is 1985, the session of 1985. Um, and I really introduced it to begin the dialogue. Never anticipated that it would pass, but we got it out of House Committee. And then we moved to the House floor, and it was a four-plus-hour debate on this bill. So, yes, we definitely raised the level of discussion. But as things turned out, there was a possibility that it was going to pass. I was surprised, given the debate and given the questions. And when it actually came down excuse me, to, to vote, we were within 13 votes of passing a single-payer bill in the Oklahoma House of Representatives in 1985. It was just amazing. The gallery was full of people, about 300 supporters of the legislation. Uh, one of those members outside it was my mom. And I'll never forget the comment when I came down to meet the supporters and the folk who were there and my mom. And she gave me a hug and the tears that welled in my eyes, of course, uh, hoping and, you know, just feeling like I had disappointed them. I let all these people down who thought that I was 
could do something to really improve access to health care services. Um, little did they know, years later, of course, we did lots of things. The 911, the sale from the sale, the mobile 911 legislation that really, it was there but never kicked off. It was a process of negotiations. I had an opportunity to lead in my bill that created um, now gives people dial 911 on your cell phone and they'll know just where you are. Um, so those are kind of, those things we've done, those things we've been, been disappointed about. The other big disappointment, I'll mention these two because they were my first year disappointments. I had to do, this one had to do with um, uh, gun control. 1985 again in Oklahoma. And I had done, of course, I had a corrections law enforcement type background, so I knew a little about this stuff. And I remember uh, thinking it was how important it was to place some, some limitations on people's ability to access weapons, handguns, and make sure they were appropriately regulated, not to take them away, but to regulate appropriately. So we introduced what now is known as the Brady Bill, but this was before the days. Uh, we introduced this bill, and sure enough, um, we got to committee, and I was excited. I had done my homework. I had the chief of police from Oklahoma City there to testify, and the person who was a district attorney at the time there. I had all of these experts there to talk about why we know for a fact that creating some uh, regulation of, of handgun possession really did help reduce violence and created safer environments. It was a great presentation. The committee meeting was great. There were a few questions asked uh, and everything went smoothly until it was time to make the motion to pass the bill. And of course, I was a committee member. So after all of the debate and questions and answers and everything was said, I was recognized and made the, the usual motion to pass on the bill. And there was silence. Not one other committee member said anything. No second, no substitute motion like do not pass or report progress, which could have come, uh, that would have at least kept the idea out there. I got nothing. Total silence. And the committee, you could have heard a pin drop in this committee room that was full of people. And as, of course, so uh, after the motion failed, for lack of a second, the bill just stayed in committee. The chair told me afterwards, the only reason why I heard the bill is because you're a committee member and I really like you. But I never thought it would pass. He said, I knew it wouldn't pass. Uh, and I was really disappointed because we had worked really hard. Of course, now what I had proposed then is now the law. Uh, so I just maybe a few years ahead of my time. But I'll never forget those experiences because I learned lots of things as a result thereof. I learned for, from the gun control bill to make sure not only do you do your homework to determine what the support should be and you know what the dialogue would be to support this legislation, mm -hmm. really do your homework to know what the 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 opposition believes and thinks and who they are. Uh, as a rule, I knew I know the rules of social change. I went to the Midwest Academy for social change in Chicago, Illinois. I know what some basic rules are and I failed to apply those rules. And in, in terms of the health care uh, reform bill, the single payer bill, uh, I learned, you know, you'd be surprised how many things can become law. So don't just anticipate that it won't happen. Therefore, you don't do the kind of work you should do. Anticipate that it will and be prepared. So it was a, it's a matter of preparation. And I guarantee I was made a better legislator throughout the rest of my career because of those two experiences. Did you do your own research or do you have someone? Oh, we have staffers. Let's just like, you know, we have researchers who, who for the most part, draft bills. Uh, we have legal staffers, fiscal staffers, all of whom can do research for us. But having been a staffer for the legislature, it was really easy for me to revert back into that role, do my own research, which I did do a lot of. I was dependent on staff too, but I know they're busy. And we didn't have our own one member. They had, in the case of the House, 101 other members possibly making certain requests and demands upon their time. So it was not unusual for me to do my own research to contact some folk that I knew and to develop some things that would provide the kind of support I needed. It was not unusual for me to even begin to draft a bill, to actually draft language of a bill because I'd done it before. Uh, members don't routinely do that. They didn't then, they definitely don't anymore. 
Well, describe a typical day. How early did you show up at the office? Oh, at the time I was elected, I had no children. I was a uh, single and footloose and fancy free. I was excited about going to work every day, so it was not unusual at all for me to show up at the Capitol building 7.30, 8 o'clock, and definitely not unusual for me to be there until 8.30 at 9 at night. My first, I loved it. And in fact, I'll never forget when I moved to the, to the Senate, uh, the, the leader of the Senate at that time, Stratton Taylor, used to always tell me there is life after the legislature. It's not in this building. You need to begin to develop things that provide a life for you. And we don't mean a living. We mean a life, a life for you after you live here, after you leave here. And that was really, really good advice because it was not unusual to spend 12 to 14 hours a day at the Capitol. And in fact, I found myself after I was elected into almost the same schedule as campaign mode, which was all day long. In fact, you might leave and go to dinner or go to an event and come back. I would come back to work. Well, of course, in 1990, um, 1996, when my sister got sick, life did change for me because kids came into my life, and which was a very good thing. It put things in perspective. And so instead of doing you know, 12, 14 hour days, they became more eight to 10 hour days. It was never a normal life. Life of the legislature is never normal. It never ends. It's seven days a week. The phone rings. I stayed listed in the phone book. People, people when they call you, they don't call to say, thanks, you're doing a great job. I appreciate it. They call because they have problems. So every call is additional work. And every call is an opportunity to be compassionate, nice, and kind to somebody, uh, even when you can't help. And you have to tell them there's nothing you can do. Uh, but that was a part of my job and responsibilities. I, I never regretted it. All the things that I did, uh, I was afforded many wonderful opportunities. We could talk more with the National Conference of State Legislatures. And, I, you know, I don't regret it. It was hard work. It consumed your life. I mean, I, I tell people you have no personal life. And I would do it again, knowing what I know now. I would definitely do it again. But I can also say now that it's over, I'm glad it's over. Well, how many women served with you at the time you were in? Not many. Not many at all. Not many in the House. Unfortunately, I had an opportunity to serve with some wonderful women. Laura Boyd uh, came in a year after me, two years, two year cycle after me. But uh, Carolyn Taylor, uh, then was Carolyn Thompson, was in the legislature, Linda Larison. Uh, Debbie Blackburn came. I mean, there were wonderful women, and and there were there were. I'm just trying to think when I went into the house if there were any Republican women. Uh, I can't think back that far, but the, it, there were few of us, and the numbers have remained pretty constant. They've grown. The numbers have grown, but Oklahoma's place in the bigger scheme of things in the world has not really changed at all in terms of women in the legislature. Um, most most of the women in, that I served with in the in the Senate were, were older women had raised their families. I didn't have small children. I was really the only woman until toward the end uh, with small children at home. It was easier for me because I lived right here in Oklahoma City. So it was like just making arrangements while you go to work. Much more difficult for many of them. We never had a women's caucus, an organized women caucus, women's caucus the whole time I served. Um, maybe party politics came into play too hard. We've attempted to, and there are attempts right now to do so, and, and I hope they can, they can do that. Even if it's just a place where women in the legislature can come and share some of the same difficulties uh, that we have on both sides of the aisles, sometimes dealing, dealing with a male-dominated, in a male-dominated environment, just share strategies for raising kids and, and balancing home and professional life. Um, and maybe not talk as much about issues if there's certainly huge gaps or huge places of disagreement. But the women's caucus, I think, is, is important. Not, and my only regret is that we did not have an organized women's caucus during the whole time that I served in the legislature. Well, how did you do things outside of your normal day, I guess, with just the women? No, not really. It wasn't time. I don't not guess. really. We, you know, it was... You know, you learn to play with the big boys, as they would say. Uh, but we, you know, there was there was this level of um, mutual support and admiration. Uh, you always had a friend out. There were mentors for me, women mentors, 
who I knew I could always go to. And Senator Maxine Horner from Tulsa, when I went into the Senate, uh, was certainly one that that kind of helped me around. And Senator Horner had been around politically. Uh, she worked for a congressman and she knew the ropes, but she was just a good uh, calming force for me in the legislature. Uh, so you, yes, and we did things. You, you found friends and compadres that you did things with that did did lead to that that the development of the relationship between women in the legislature. I just I really look forward to the day when women are proportionately represented in legislative bodies. I just think the whole outcome of the legislative process would be so different and better, better. Let me quickly say, not just different, but better. And how soon do you think that will happen? <laughs> Maybe not, not, not in my lifetime. Life. You know, it's just hard because the, the job itself does not lend, lend well to what traditionally uh, women view as a career opportunity for them. I was visiting with a lobbyist friend of mine who has a four-year-old, soon to be four-year-old son. She lives in the Tulsa vicinity, not in Tulsa, but the Tulsa vicinity. It was easy when the baby was small and she would go home, spend more a day during the week at home. Hubby would bring the baby here and her mom and the baby would stay here in the city a few days with her and maybe one night, one day would go by that she didn't see the small child. Well, now the baby is almost four. So it's time for school and a more consistent program. And she faces a huge dilemma. You know, do I really go away and stay away from home three, four days out of a week and just leave dad there to nurture him? Or do I have to make a big career choice and figure out how I can stay at home or Moving to Oklahoma City was not an option uh, because of some family opportunities in the area. So it's difficult. And we it won't happen. I tell you this, it won't happen until we can do work when we have workplace daycare much more available. It won't happen until men realize that they too, just like women, can raise families and do a pretty doggone good job at it. You know, because when men legislators leave home and are gone for four weeks, four, four days out of the week, mom is at home raising children and no one says, oh, that's not a good thing. So it's a mindset change. And then just trying to deal with this guilt that women feel. And I feel it now when I travel sometimes and leave, you know, kids at home or with, of course they're not home by themselves, they're in the care of others who really love them. But it's like, but that's my job and I should be there. So we have a whole lot of things internally and externally to deal with. Um, and the key though, I think really is to start with women when they're much younger, girls, and opening this up as a career opportunity. It's just like the sciences, where girls never thought they could be physicians. It was always a nurse. You know, well, we can be lots of things, but we have to start with them young to explore and share with the, with the young women these concepts. So if I had an opportunity and we're going to build a program to get more women into elective service, it would start at college, which is great. I mean, we need to, to do that, but it would start at third or fourth grade and there would be these routine kinds of encounters with these girls in public service and elective office kinds of things that they wouldn't even realize is elective office kind of stuff, but it would be into just to brand uh, this this uh, profession with them as a, as a logical, reasonable profession to really make a difference in the world that they exist. Sounds like a new plan needs to come along. Well, there. one of these days, one of these days, I have a whole long list of things to do, like write a book and start a foundation, and, and I'll be, so that's why I have to live till I'm about 120 to accomplish all these goals. And you stated earlier you'd like to do a PhD. That'll yeah, too. that come in handy. You know, now now that I'm in my new job at OU Health Sciences Center in the world of academics, um, I've always thought I'd want to go back to school, but you know, it becomes probably more critical in this kind of environment than others. And it's been 30 years since I finished grad school or began grad school. So the thought of uh, going back to college Actually, it's very exciting on one hand because I love the dialogue. I teach some. I love the dialogue. I love the interaction in the classroom. I love the reading. 
and I really wouldn't even mind doing the papers and the research. So I'm, I think, so why am I being apprehensive? Well, it's new and it's different and it's a commitment of time uh, that that's blocked off on that calendar that you can't fudge and say, well, I'll come back to it later. You got to be there in that classroom. So and maybe that's what my life needs is even more structure right about now. That's really a joke. So, but life is good. Uh, we'll, we'll come back. I want to talk to, about my experiences uh, with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Okay. I don't want to forget that one. Go ahead. Okay. In CSL. In CSL, of course, the National Conference of State Legislatures, okay. which is, as the tagline goes, the premier organization representing all 50 state legislatures and legislatures of U.S. territories with several international affiliate members. Uh, for the support and the and the encouragement and the research and the use of use by state legislators and their staffers, it's a very large organization that is comprised of all legislators by virtue of their election to office. They are a member of NCSL, um, and it is uh, the the place the place that uh, le elected officials go in the state. Sometimes executive branch do. Uh, but certainly legislative leaders and legislators, and it is the place for staffers to go to when they're looking for research, comparative information, looking to see what's happening in the world of state legislatures, bills being passed. Uh, we don't do model legislation. It's simply a clearinghouse and a place to share info. NCSL um, is... Uh, long, older than 25, 26 years old. I can't remember how old we are now, uh, but I had the distinction of serving as the first uh, African-American female president of that organization and actually the first woman that served as president uh, who was elected as the vice president slot, which is where the election actually occurs. And then it's a four-year continuation as an officer. And I, I started and stopped. The only other woman that had ever been elected in that vice presidency slot is now in Congress. And she left after two years, left the legislature after a couple of years to run for a congressional seat. And she was successful. So it's really the first time. So it was important for me to show that a woman could hold this role. It's a very, very busy role. When I was in CSL president, I probably traveled 200, 225, 250,000 miles in one year. And it was just for three years, just like a mad race. It was just like always on the go. You know, couple that with your home legislative responsibility and a national responsibility to it. Uh, and you realize how busy one gets. Don't regret that either at all. And it did afford me the opportunity to travel around the world, really, to meet with presidents, to meet with other heads of states, to talk about the value of whether it's state legislatures or provincial legislatures in other countries, to the whole process of making social change and creating public policy. It's a wonderful experience, the friends that you meet, but the knowledge you gain about how the world can be different, the insight that you gain about, well, maybe America is really a great country, which I love and I think, and every time we land back in the U.S. from an international, I think, thank you. It's good to be home again. Uh, but it was an opportunity to become more exposed to different ways of doing things and different ways of thinking about things. I think therein lies the ability of this country to compete globally, this exposure to teach and make sure people understand that the world is not narrow. It's not narrowly focused and we don't all think alike, but it's extraordinarily broad with lots of ideas and thoughts about how government should work, about how people should be represented. None of them are bad per se, none of them are good per se. They just are and they are different. And I think once we come to the realization that there are many ways to govern, uh, depending on the history of the people and depending on where the people are, um, many ways to govern that are not abusive, that are not, um, uh, are controlling. I mean, there are open opportunities, and uh, then we think we think differently. We become better legislators. So my experience with NCSL really, I think, made me a better Oklahoma legislator. 
It put me in touch with a whole bunch of folk that I could advocate better for Oklahoma, whether it's on the national level or whatever it might be. And so there were advantages to Oklahoma as well, uh, to that position. But it's it was a wonderful experience that 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 I really, really enjoy and would again do that again for the opportunity, but only one year. Only one year. That was enough. Do you anticipate going further like into to Congress or should, oh, I, should I not ask No, that? that's a fair question. I get asked that question all the time. Am that's I going to pursue other offers? You know, a year ago, I would have quickly answered that question, no. I uh, wouldn't have even thought about it. It would have been a definite no. Uh, I like having my life again. I like having my privacy, you know, being able to schedule things and do things that are for kids or for family or for whomever. Uh, I just like not being under total scrutiny all the time or feeling the obligation to always be available and to go and to be you know, and to, to speak to or whatever the job demanded. However, in the last few months, there's this sense again, this same overwhelming feeling of obligation and responsibility. As you look around and see the many, many issues that all of us are confronted with, and you think, well, maybe there is something I could do. Maybe there is a role for me to play in coming to some resolution whether it's on violence in our communities, whether it's the dismal graduation rate of students in Oklahoma, whether it's the extreme high reading remediation rate that's needed when kids go to college, therefore we know they've not learned what they needed to learn in their secondary and elementary training, um, whatever it might be that I, that I know is having huge and extreme effect on our, on our society, on our culture that maybe I have a responsibility to do something. Well, of course, being in an elective office uh, gives you the bully pulpit, it gives you the form, it gives you the clout that you need to begin talking about some of these issues, to put a concrete plan on the table to address these issues. So will I run for elective office again? I'm not gonna say no. I can't say I don't have anything in mind. I can also say I wouldn't want to be one of 435, if you know what I mean. That's this. Congress is probably off the table. Not a bad idea to be one of 100, uh, but I'm not announcing a U.S. Senate race either. Uh, there are a lot of good candidates out there that are contemplating upcoming. And for now, I really, really enjoy what I do at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Again, the opportunity to change the course of the future. And, and as it relates to health care, I... I not only do I still do policy issues, not legislative, but policy issues that make this campus and our programs more responsible, responsive to a, a diverse population. I also have the wonderful opportunity in our division here to create that diverse population of students and faculty and staff. Um, we don't fare well in Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, in our recruitment of what we consider underrepresented minorities, whether they're racial or, or ethnic or income status uh, type minorities. We don't do that well. It's pretty a, a pretty pretty much a homogeneous kind of group of students around this campus. So uh, my boss, Dr. Joe Ferretti, I know has for years since he came here in this post, great concern and great desire to change the hue of the campus, to make us look more like a, a community, a community of people we serve. So it was a wonderful opportunity. Now I get a chance to work some with fifth graders, with 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, to talk to them about becoming a health scientist, whether it's a researcher or a provider, or whatever it might be. So I feel that I'm being, being well used here. I, I feel a sense of satisfaction here. Uh, I'm not pushing or encouraging or asking anybody to think with me about running for elective office. If the opportunity clearly presents itself and it's clear that it was of no doing or making of my own, kind of like divine intervention, uh, well, then maybe I would consider it. But we'll just wait and see. Waiting. Patience is a virtue, my friend. Remember that always, always. Oh, is there anything I need to ask you that I haven't? Or anything you want to talk about that I've we have? I've been talking a long no, time. Good. Well, 
Well, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? I, that's interesting. It's like, what do you want it to say on your on your grave marker? Uh, actually, I, I think I would like people to remember me for being a people person, uh, being regular, you know, maintaining really maintaining the grounding and the values that my mom and dad taught me about relationships one with another. I don't want to re be remembered for things that I did singularly because as a solo participant, I probably have not done much. Uh, but as an individual working with and sometimes leading, sometimes following others, I think we've accomplished a lot of things. I, you know, I had I was NAACP president in Oklahoma City uh, for, for a period of time before going to work at the legislature and during my early years working for the legislature. And I just, I've had opportunities to see great need. Uh, the great need that so many people have in so many ways. And yet, to some extent, it's better now than it was 30, 40 years ago. But in many instances, it's worse now than it was then. So if people can just remember me for the work that I did with and for others, um, that'd be great. But if they don't remember me at all, and this is what I tell folk, the chances are, you know, 50 years, 25 years, someone said even two years after I die, people just may not remember you at all. And that's okay. Uh, you know, that's okay. Not that I, I won't be bothered with that, I guarantee you, in the afterlife. That will not bother me. But as long as people can benefit from the things that I have done, therein lies the ability to remember me. So that's, that really is what I'm seeking for, just to, to be a steward, good steward of time, good steward of resources given to me, to understand that, you know, we as a people are so interconnected, you know, Really, so I walk into a room of students, of elementary school students, of preschool students, and I look at their faces and I think, what wonderful potential. What wonderful potential rests right in this room to discover cures to terrible diseases, to become wonderful teachers that enlighten and, and create a desire to learn among other young people. It's all right in this room. So what are we going to do to make sure that happens? You know, what what is it that we as individuals contribute to the nature of things to make sure that that happens? And it's a pretty heavy duty sense. And I know that sounds so philosophical and pie in the sky, but it is what drives me. I guarantee you it is that thought, that philosophy, that vision, that spirit that drives me and without question, uh, it is in the spirit. I, I have strong spiritual beliefs. I have uh, strong convictions about um, our, our, why we were created and what our mission is in life. I have strong, strong beliefs that God empowers us to do things and places us where we should be. And our job is to do it. Our job is to do it and we will be equipped with everything that that is yet to come. So that's my sense of who I am. Life is good. I, I had, if I can just say this to, to end, uh, 2005, the year I left the legislature, was a huge transition year for me, uh, the smallest of which was leaving the legislature. Uh, my significant other, Robert, Dr. Kennedy, uh, my 20-year partner, was diagnosed with lung cancer in December of 04. He was not a smoker. I did not smoke. He was one of the very small numbers of folk who contract lung cancer for no reason to be determined. Um, and Robert died in 10 months after his diagnosis. Six weeks prior to Robert's death, my mom unexpectedly died. So my brother during 2005 had several amputations. This is my young brother and was a diabetic. And life was just hard. It was really, really hard for me uh, in 2005, but I persevered. I never gave up. Even going through difficult times, um, I always knew that things would be better. And the Sunday after my mom's Friday death, my mom was a minister, was a preacher, was a pastor of a church. 
I found a, a manuscript that she had written some time ago. It was on a small piece, small pages, small papers that she used to write on when she first started writing. And the title was Life Goes Better with Faith, Believe and Receive. Now, she spoke directly to my heart about the complications and difficulties in life, but about the necessity to continue to be faithful and to believe that things will turn out all right as you go through these difficult times. And those words did sustain me during some very difficult times. It made me draw on the faith that I knew about, that I had experienced, that had grown in my heart and in my mind, because it is an intellectual exercise, you see, to believe things that you cannot see. Uh, it is very intellectual. And to utilize that and to know for certain that things would be better. And to be able today, now some 18 months or so later, to simply say, life is really good. I am very happy. Um, opportunities have been open to me that I never would have imagined. Uh, people love me that I never would have imagined. Uh, people are, are caring for me and I have the opportunity to care back and still move toward the mission of changing lives uh, for people and contributing any way I can. So life is good. Even after the legislature, life is very, very good. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. You're very welcome. I'm glad to do so.